In the Middle Ages, a man wounded in battle could expect a lot of pain. Surgeons knew about natural drugs like opium, deadly nightshade and henbane root, which ground up and drunk could take the pain away. But they were poisonous too and dangerous. They might anaesthetise or they might kill. Medieval surgeons were always looking for better, safer drugs. By the 19th century, chemists had learned that organic compounds could be synthesised. Vola made urea in the laboratory. Kolbe made acetic acid, which is basically vinegar. And Berthelot made alcohol, all from basic chemicals. By the 1850s, quite a few chemists were trying to synthesise natural substances, including drugs, in the laboratory. The middle of the 19th century is a very important time for chemistry. This is the time when all of the experience is beginning to make sense. This is when Franklin suggests that each kind of atom has a specific combining power, its valency. Kekulé publishes his structural diagrams on organic molecules. And Mendeleev comes out with the periodic table. This is also the time when chemistry turns out its first whiz kid an 18-year-old student who became famous when he made a fortune overnight. William Henry Perkin was a college student with a passion for chemistry. His teacher had wondered about synthesising quinine, the only drug known to stop malaria. Malaria then as now was one of the world's most troublesome diseases and quinine could only be had from the bark of a tree. Perkin, working on the basic formula and blissfully ignorant of the molecular structure of quinine, set to work in a laboratory that he built at home. Not surprisingly, far from getting quinine, he just ended up with a dirty brown goo. The story goes that he was washing this out with alcohol when it turned into a beautiful purple solution, a solution that was a very good purple dye. Aniline Purple made Perkins' fortune. He went into business selling the dye called Mauve, and by 23, he was rich. Of course, Perkins' story hit the newspapers, and people took a lot of interest. This was really the beginning of serious industrial chemistry, because Perkins' other achievement was in scaling up the laboratory procedure. He found ways of making the dye safely in large quantities. So, with the discoveries of molecular structure and the periodic table coming at about the same time, this game of trying to copy nature's chemicals really took off. But it was not all plain sailing. Take isomerism, for example. Kekulé's diagrams clearly showed how you could expect different arrangements of a group of atoms producing different shaped molecules and therefore different substances with the same basic formula. Structural diagrams predicted and explained the many isomers that would be possible. But in one case, they did not. Some substances came in two unpredicted versions, where the difference was as subtle as the way they altered light. There are quite a few molecules that do odd things to light. You've only got to look at an LCD screen, for instance, or a digital watch to see how we've made use of them. Here's another example. This crystal of Iceland spa shows a double image. The calcium carbonate molecules twist the light and split it into two beams. Now, a number of organic molecules do something similar in that they twist the light without splitting it. Now, since the beam of light stays together, you can't see that with a naked eye, but a polarimeter shows it up. It automatically measures the optical rotation in the sample we've just put in the machine. A typical substance that twists light is common sugar. Another is glyceraldehyde. This is left-handed glyceraldehyde, and this is right-handed glyceraldehyde. One rotates light to the left, and the other rotates light exactly the same amount, but to the right. These are called optical isomers. So how does this come about? 
Why is it that the conventional structural diagram of glyceraldehyde cannot indicate that there are two and only two versions of it? The answer was simple, but very important. In 1874, two young chemists, Van Hoff and Lebel, pointed out that molecules existed in three-dimensional space, not as flat drawings on paper. Carbon's four bonds stuck out in space like a tetrahedron. It was a matter of three-dimensional geometry. Look at this. Here's a carbon atom with its four bonds sticking out into space as far apart as possible. Now, if we attach four different atoms or groups of atoms, we end up with a unique situation. Here's another molecule, which is identical. See that? I've made them to be identical. Now, if we swap two of the attached groups, any two will do, we end up with a different arrangement. But look at this. It turns out to be the mirror image. Any way you look at it, it's the mirror image. It's almost as though I could hold it in front of a mirror like this. It doesn't matter how many changes you make, there's only two ways the arrangement can turn out, as a mirror image or identical. Now this only happens when all four substituents are different and it explains why there are two and only two optical isomers formed in each case, except for any other isomers you can correctly predict with a flat diagram. Now you need at least four bonds for this to occur and carbon is by far the most common. Back then, Van Hoff and Lebel didn't exactly know why carbon's bonds pushed as far apart as possible. It was an intelligent guess. Of course, later, when the electron was discovered, after the turn of the century, we learned that carbon's four bonds were based on its four outer electrons. Electrons having a negative charge repelled each other into these positions around the atom. So, for organic compounds, we have a variety of ways to represent them. Take glyceraldehyde. Here's its basic formula, but for substances like this, we've seen it's not very helpful. Then we have a structural formula which shows some bonds, which is better, but still doesn't tell the whole story. Finally, we have a three-dimensional diagram which shows the bonds drawn, as it were, into and out of the page. Or we can have a molecular model which shows all the bonds. Look, here's the characteristic aldehyde double bonded oxygen up here. And if we swap two of the attached groups around the central carbon, we'll get another molecule, which is a mirror image, its optical isomer. With this more sophisticated understanding of the way molecules were formed, chemists rapidly learned ways to manipulate organic compounds. They learned how to substitute other atoms for hydrogen on a carbon chain and to shorten or lengthen the chains. They learned how to split, double or triple bonds and how to form or break rings. Using their knowledge of functional groups, they analysed useful natural compounds and deliberately tried to synthesise them. A classic example was the alkaloid drug cocaine. Discovered in the New World in the leaves of the coca plant, it had been used for centuries as a drug and as an analgesic, a painkiller. But it was addictive and dangerous. From medieval times, surgeons had desired something better. This is the molecule of cocaine, and obviously it is very complex. In 1905, chemists came up with this variation, and by good fortune it worked brilliantly as a painkiller without any of the addictive side effects. Dentists still use it nearly a century later under the trade name Novocaine. Novocaine was good news, one of the true improvements on the chemistry of nature. It would be followed sometime later by xylocaine, an even stronger, safe anaesthetic. However, the alkaloid story doesn't end there. Alkaloids are nitrogen containing, bitter tasting substances derived mainly from plants and well known as drugs, medicines or poisons. Very common examples are caffeine and nicotine and others like codeine, 
atropine and strychnine appear in medicines or commercial poisons. Unfortunately, attempts to improve on them were not always successful. From the opium poppy comes morphine. With the attempt in 1898 to improve its power and make it non-addictive was only half successful. Synthesised from morphine, diacetylmorphine is much more powerful, but it turned out to be one of the most addictive drugs ever. It's best known these days by its early trade name, heroin. Nevertheless, over the last century, most synthetic organic compounds have been very much to human benefit. Better drugs, antiseptics, antibiotics and vaccines have increased our lifespan. Oil provides energy for vehicles and devices that have revolutionised the way we live. Most of the fuel that we use today is light petroleum and this must be synthesised or cracked from the heavy fractions of crude oil. In addition to fuels, this processing also supplies alkenes and alkynes, which will be later synthesised into polymers and plastics. So the oil refinery runs a huge organic chemistry process that is central to our way of life. Nor could we produce enough food these days if it were not for the use of artificial fertilisers and insecticides. The preservation of food has been improved by stabilisers, antioxidants and sequestrants. Not to mention the way the invention of CFC gases allowed refrigeration to become available to everyone. CFC gases were useful as propellants and solvents too. But these synthetic gases also illustrate the fact that while a little may be safe, a lot may not. The Earth's ozone layer has been damaged by the widespread use of CFCs, which at first were thought to be completely safe. They are now banned. Certain insecticides, like the highly effective DDT, were found to be concentrating in the food chain and built up in the fat of animals, fish and birds to dangerous levels. Here is another organic creation that has had to be made illegal. Issues like these will continue to worry us, at the same time as we enjoy ever more benefits from our ability to improve on the chemistry of nature. For the fact is that while we have learned so much, we are still far from a full understanding of what that most versatile atom carbon can do.